Welcome to this first Sunday reflection of this new term. A very happy new year to you. In spite of the rather strange circumstances we continue to find ourselves in. I'm going to think a little about the Old Testament reading that you will find on the attached order of service with the email that Father Nick will have sent around. It's a passage from the first book of Samuel and it includes, it involves the calling of the prophet Samuel. Many of you will be aware that I am very keen to keep the name of Lord Shaftesbury to the forefront of school life, which is now so much easier with the Shaftesbury Enterprise. Many of you are involved in its many projects and working with local schools, community centres and old people's homes and with agencies like Spear, Firm Foundation and Young Harrow Carers. Anthony Ashley Cooper, the eventual 7th Earl of Shaftesbury, was a boy in the Headmasters in the early 19th century, just at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. He identifies an incident here on the hill as being instrumental in setting him on his life of social reform. Looking out of his window towards St Mary's, he witnessed the funeral of a destitute person possibly a late resident of the parish workhouse, which happens to be where I live at 35 West Street, West Street and from where I am talking to you now. The body was being carried by a group of drunken coffin bearers who dropped it on the hill. The incident is commemorated on the side of the old schools. For Shaftesbury, this was the moment he was prompted, in a similar way to Samuel, in our reading, to respond, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. He knew he had to act to tackle the poverty which was reflected in such deep disrespect for another human being, even a dead one. Each year, on the 1st of October, the Church of England commemorates the life and work of Anthony Ashley Cooper, the 7th Earl of Shaftesbury. Today, the 17th of January, the Church of England commemorates another old Harrovian, who identifies an incident while he was at Harrow as the moment he made a crucial decision about his future. In 1868, Charles Gore was a boy in Bradby's, aged 15. He was listening to a sermon preached by a maths master of the time, the Reverend Brooke Foss Westcott, who went on to become one of the most famous and socially engaged bishops of Durham. He was preaching on what he called the disciplined life, taking St Benedict, St Francis and St Ignatius Loyola as examples of that life. Each had founded religious communities, which exist to this day, the Benedictines, the Franciscans and the Jesuits. The young Gore, listening to that sermon, heard that call, and the community of the resurrection a community of Church of England monks, was founded 24 years later, in 1892. Father Stewart and I spent some time living with that community in our own preparation for priesthood. Little did I realise at the time that I would then spend the greater part of my ministry in the school at which Charles Gore was educated, and indeed heard the call to found the community. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I think I would consider it something of a modern miracle if 24 years from now I was to discover one of you listening today had founded a community of monks. But as you do reflect upon what you are intending to do with 
your life and the decisions you will need to make in order for it all to happen, what questions are you going to be asking of yourselves? While I was engaged in this process, I was absolutely clear about what I was going to do. All my choices revolved around the desire to read chemistry, with physics and maths as the obvious supporting A-levels. There was no question in my mind about the path I would take. Chemistry at university, followed by research and then in industry. Be warned. Look what happened. God had other ideas. Most of you will not be very clear about the career choice, your career choice at this stage. Beyond perhaps the few of you who have decided to read medicine or join the army. Yet this term is marked by having to make decisions which may indeed have an influence on the careers you end up pursuing. Those of you in the shells will be choosing GCSEs. Those of you in the fifth form will be considering A-level subjects. While those of you in the upper sixth will be faced about decisions about which university offer you are going to accept and whether or not you might end up taking a gap year. It would be so much easier if we could say with Samuel, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. But it clearly wasn't simple for Samuel either. Samuel was confused. Who was calling? Was it his mentor, Eli? The Bible is utterly realistic in its record of other human beings discerning the call of God in their lives. And as such, it can be a resource and encouragement as we embark on those crucial decisions about what we are going to do with our lives. In the passage from 1 Samuel, there is a real sense of restlessness on Samuel's part as he seeks to respond to this voice he perceives. Eli tells him to lie down again, and then eventually to listen. Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, spends time in the wilderness considering the most effective way of fulfilling his mission. Similarly, in our own lives, we need to give ourselves time to listen, to think, even to pray. Prayer has a powerful role to play in this process. Over the course of this term, there are a series of careers presentations. I would encourage you to attend as many as possible, even if they are in areas that you feel you may not be interested in or are not quite the right fit. I remember going to a conference about chemical engineering, which I found really interesting, but I came away absolutely convinced that chemical engineering was not the path I would eventually follow. There just wasn't enough chemistry. But I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't gone to the conference. In the passage, Samuel was not only confused by the voice but he could not have known where it came from without Eli's advice. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And so it is with us. We need the advice of others in the exciting task of discerning our way in the world. Friends, family, Beaks and matrons, those who know us best. They are our greatest resource. Like Samuel, God is calling us, each and every one of us, to become the people he wishes us to be. Every one of us has a place in his kingdom, a contribution to make in building that kingdom.
whether we are to be lawyers, accountants, bankers, doctors, dentists, teachers, or priests. We become what we do. We naturally identify ourselves in part by what we do. Our doing becomes our being. There is a tendency to want to drive a wedge between our working lives and our private lives. An attitude reflected in the comment, I behave in one way while I'm at work or at school, but of course I am totally different at home or with my friends. I want to challenge that distinction, not least because it sounds rather schizophrenic. Surely we are called to be people of integrity, people who bring the same attitudes and aptitudes to work as we exercise in our personal relationships. If I'm a scheming, deceitful, dishonest lawyer, accountant, or even priest, then I'm likely to be a scheming, deceitful, dishonest person. An old Herovian friend of mine is a shipbroker. His CV mentioned that he held the bishop's licence to administer communion, something that he had begun doing here in the chapel. This clearly identified him as a committed Christian. In his interview, he was questioned about this. Indeed, he was presented with a scenario. What would he do if, while entertaining a client, it was requested that he should take that client to a strip club? He had the integrity to say that he would not accompany the client and he would explain why. He was given the job because he was a person of moral courage and personal integrity. Our doing becomes our being. May each of us, faced with decisions in the coming weeks, months, years, be given the grace to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, and thereby discern our individual and unique contribution to the world.